Hi, my name is Laura Albrecht, and I am a PhD student in the Applied Mathematics and Statistics Department. Today, I'm going to talk about my project simulating COVID-19 transmission under different testing scenarios on the Colorado School of Mines campus. Just some quick background information. We have approximately 5,000 students taking classes face-to-face -face this semester and last semester. There are 2,000 students in our surveillance testing program. This consists of all resident students and athletes that are being required to test at some testing frequency. This started as once every other week at the beginning of the fall semester and switched to once a week, at probably mid-October. And now post spring break, they're being asked to test twice a week. Testing is also available for all other students and faculty, but it's not required. Our goal is to develop a mathematical model that can be used to predict the spread and evaluate the effectiveness of various testing strategies for reducing the spread of COVID-19 on our campus. These models can be used for decision-making purposes to evaluate strategies such as how does changing the testing frequency, that is how frequently the surveillance testing program individuals are being tested impact the spread on campus? How does changing the percentage of people tested or the number of people in our surveillance testing program impact the spread? And what happens if additional people are exposed after different breaks like Thanksgiving, winter, and spring break? Uh, we start by building a compartmental model. Compartmental models are used to track the flow of individuals through different stages of the disease. So this example is an SEIQR model. Uh, we start with S, we have susceptible individuals that are able to contract the disease. At some probability, they'll come into contact with infected individuals and potentially move into the E compartment or exposed. This is individuals who have been infected but are not yet infectious or detectable. That is, they are not going to be able to spread the disease to anyone else and they won't test positive for it yet but they have been infected and they will be uh, become infectious soon. For COVID, this is thought to be about two to three days. So after two to three days, an individual in E is going to transition into I or infected. And these are individuals that are capable of transmitting the disease to other people. So at some testing frequency, these individuals in I get tested and then they'll move into quarantine or isolation. Um, Individuals in quarantine are effectively no longer able to impact anyone else in the system, so they're not infecting new people, but it's a good thing to include to track so that we know how many people we have in quarantine on campus at a given time, since we have limited quarantine space um, for on-campus residents. Individuals in queue are then going to transition into R or recovered after 10 days of isolation. And then our recovered individuals are no longer going to be able to contract the disease. So they're considered immune and recovered from the disease. We can further extend this model to incorporate additional stages that are useful to track, such as asymptomatic versus symptomatic infections, quarantine and close contacts, and testing. So before I get to our extended model, just a few things I want to point out here. If a test comes back positive, that positive individual will go into isolation for 10 days. All of that person's N, which we'll initially just call 10 for now, closest contacts will go into quarantine. So if I test positive, I'm gonna have 10 friends that I've been in contact with that will go into quarantine. Uh, we make a few assumptions just for the sake of simplicity to get started here. Symptomatic individuals will all get tested within two days of developing symptoms. Um, we assume all test results are completely accurate, so there's no false positive or false negative rate. Susceptible individuals in quarantine cannot become infected with COVID. So if you go into quarantine um, as susceptible, you'll come out as susceptible. So this is the extended model here, and there's just a few things I'll point out, but essentially it still boils down to we've got an S compartment, an E, I's, Q's, and R's. So we'll start with the S's. Now either the S is going to transition into E or they'll move into SQ, which is going to be the quarantine for susceptible individuals. At the end of their quarantine, they'll come right back into being S. So they don't really change much other than they're removed from being able to be infected during that time. Now our exposed individuals will either transition 
to IA or infected asymptomatic or IS infected symptomatic. This is an important thing to include in a disease like COVID where we know there is a lot of asymptomatic infection that is occurring. So once we're infected here, the infected asymptomatics, if they're in the testing surveillance program, then they'll get tested at some rate and go into IAT. At the rate that their test results come back, they'll transition into QI or isolation. Infected and asymptomatic individuals that don't get tested will just end up transitioning over into recovered undetected at the end of their infectious period. So after 10 to 14 days, they'll recover, but we won't know that they've recovered, so they're considered recovered undetected. For symptomatic individuals, we assume most people will get tested within two days of developing symptoms, and then they'll transition into QI once their test results come back. The few that don't will go into that recovered undetected. So now for our quarantine compartments, we're going to have the QI isolation, which after 10 days of isolation, they'll transition into RD or recovered detected. Um, and then we've got this QQ, which is going to be our quarantine compartment. And anyone who started as either an E, an I, or an R will end up in QQ. And after their 14 days of quarantine, they will become, we assume they're recovered by the end of that, and they will go to recovered undetected. So now we end up with two R compartments instead of just the one. We've got the recovered detectives, which are the ones we can measure, and we know how many people end up there, and recovered undetecteds, which we don't have a good idea of how many individuals fall into that category. So this is just an example of the output that can be generated from this model at a given set of parameter values. So it just gives you an idea of what these curves would look like. I just added up all of the compartments that are in one of these categories, like all of the eyes go into this infected curve, et cetera. So there's 11 compartments in this model, and there's only three that we actually have data for that we can compare to directly. The first is going to be the cumulative, cumulative cases, which is comparable to that recovered detected compartment. And then we have an isolation compartment and the quarantine. That's all we have data for. But we can use the data from these three to get better estimates of our model parameters to run this model into the future and look at different scenarios. So one I want to look at is what happens after spring break. Uh, we can run this model through spring break, get estimates of the individuals in each of those compartments. We assume we have, let's say, 10 individuals come back from spring break that are infected that weren't when they left. And we want to know how does increasing the testing frequency or the number of people tested impact the spread of the virus by the end of the semester. So if we look at increasing the testing frequency for that surveillance testing group, on the left I've got the infectious curve, so this is anyone in one of those I compartments, and then on the right is the quarantine curve, anyone in the quarantine compartments. Um, we see there's pretty drastic improvement from testing every two weeks to testing once a week. And then testing from once a week to twice a week, we still see for infectious, there's a 60% drop in the total infectious by the end of the semester. For quarantine going from once to twice a week, we have a 58% drop. So this is definitely something that increased testing can help in this scenario in this time frame, which is great. There's still a lot of work to be done on this model. Uh, there's a lot of things we'd like to incorporate that I've already mentioned, such as the spread during quarantine, reinfection of recovered individuals, uh, false positive and false negative rates. We need to add a compartment for vaccinated individuals since vaccines are a thing now, yay. Um, we'd like to include additional subpopulations so we can get better probabilities of contact and probability of transmission based on which category you fall into, resident, students, non-resident, et cetera. And ultimately, I'd like to turn this into a network model where we can track the individual risk and connecting, connectedness of the entire campus. Thank you for coming and listening to my talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email's on the slide.